energy democracy. I wanted to go through that first. And, um, and then Alana Day from the ITF is going to do um, talk about what the ITF is doing in its analysis of climate change uh, as it pertains to the transport sector. So um, this session is the Climate Challenge, Trade Unions uh, Struggle for Energy Democracy. My name is Sean Sweeney, I direct the Cornell Global Labor Institute. We were the second wave GLI to start. There's a funny story that I didn't know there was another GLI. So I Googled Global Labor Institute, spelled it in the American way, the US way, and then set up Global Labor Institute. And I got an angry email from Dan Deline, somebody who I respected for 25 years, but lost touch with him and he said, we're the global. <laughs> so now we have, a good, a happy ending to the story is we now have four, three and three or four global labor institutes established and now we have a network. So that's just a little bit of background about how um, the work they do. One, one of the things that Dan mentioned was the sort of the need for a new narrative, a unifying narrative. And in our assessment, the ecological crisis is as big a crisis for capitalism and the human species and all living things on the planet as any other crisis. So it needs to be integrated as part of the battles we're facing um, uh, as workers fighting austerity and fighting neoliberalism and looking for alternatives. So in our view, the abuse of the environment and the abuse of the workers are two sides of the same coin. That it's a system that is profoundly abusive to ecology and abusive to people and all living things. So part of the narrative then is how do, how do we deal with it? And we've all heard about climate change. <coughs> the enormity of the challenge of global warming. It's easy to become extremely despondent about it. And many people have. They kind of said, we can't do anything about it. Let's just uh, you know, just you know, carry on as best we can. Or hope it's not true. A lot of people are in denial about it. But in the global north in particular, the key piece of the solution to climate change or addressing the emissions problem is the energy sector, power generation. So much of uh, it's really, if you think of emissions as coming from the combustion of fossil fuels, that happens in the global north in, in two main areas. One is power generation, what we use to power electrical generation, and the second is in the transportation sector. And the third section, which is really important, is the building sector, but that's because of the power generation sector. So if you deal with energy and energy production, you can actually attack this problem right at the heart of it. And while you're doing that, we're not attacking emissions, we're attacking corporations. Mm -hmm. Because they are the ones who are perpetuating the problem and refusing to do anything about it because of profit, growth, and accumulation. So it's a kind of a strategic approach to the problem. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, why there is what we're calling an energy emergency, which is a planetary crisis, that the energy transitions, uh, the energy transition we need, which is largely from fossil fuel based energy to renewable based energy, is simply not happening. And this is, I think, an important point to stress in the trade union debates, because many people in the unions have started to embrace the green economy, there's the good capitalists who are green and the bad ones who are not green, and we've got to support the good ones against the bad ones. That kind of assessment of uh, the situation is profoundly false and politically self-defeating. And the third part of my presentation is going to touch on what we're trying to do with the um, Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, which for short I'm going to call 2ED. So if you're 2ED, it's not the most pleasant sounding name, but it saves time. Then we'll talk about where, what that project is and what progress it's made so far. So just go through these slides pretty quickly in the interest of time. Um, about a year ago, the International Energy Agency, which is a pretty conservative policy group that talks about the trends in the global energy system, produced a report that said if the present trajectory for energy uh, is not interrupted and interrupted violently, then we're looking at six degrees Celsius of global warming by the end of the century. Now, that's about 11 or so for those from the US, that's about 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Bear in mind that we've had warming of about one degree Celsius or a little under one degree, and we've already lost half of 
glaciers and half the Arctic melt. We've got growing instances of extreme weather, um, disruption across the climate, which is causing massive havoc on the lives of, of people, not just in the global south, but that's where it's starting. Massive amounts of problems and droughts in agriculture, uh, loss of water supplies, and so on. But it's also increasingly becoming an issue in the global north. In my city, New York City, Hurricane Sam, we're still cleaning up from that devastation. 40 people in New York City alone were killed by that storm. And uh, it was the biggest hurricane recorded in North America. So this is what we face if we don't act. Um, let's also try to dispel the myth that fossil fuels are running out. A few years ago, we would have got the view that, well, it's peak oil. We're going to run out anyway, so we should have renewable energy because fossil fuels are going to go. I mean, largely, you've probably heard of the phrase peak oil, the idea that it's going to get more and more expensive to produce oil, that oil is generally running out, and therefore, it's inevitable there's going to be a transition to a renewables-based economy. Renewables, by what I mean, is mostly wind, solar, geothermal, renewable sources of energy. Uh, if there's any questions necessary to clarify that, we can do that later. But this, these figures are important. This is the fossil fuels above the line of what has been used already, um, emitted into the atmosphere. And this underneath is the reserves that are still in the ground. And here is the sort of, to the political target for global warming is two degrees Celsius. Some of you who follow climate politics know that two degrees Celsius was a political accommodation. It says that if we go above two degrees, we've got a 50-50 chance of stabilizing the climate. Well, those odds are not particularly good. That's like Russian roulette with two and a half bullets in a five bullet chamber. It's not a particularly good off odds. And the latest, latest science is that if one degree is causing this level of trouble, two degrees, particularly for the tropical regions, is going to cause a lot more trouble. So two degrees, we'll stick to it for now, but bear in mind that we really don't have the option of two degrees Celsius warming on average. This is how many gigatons of carbon that would go into the atmosphere uh, to... You the yeah, don't touch the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> This is the gigatons that we have left to burn if to stay under two degrees, if you want to use the two degrees target. These are the reserves, 2,795 gigatons <coughs> of fossil fuel in reserve, already playing a role in the economy. This is based on lots of the capitalization of the fossil fuel companies are based on their reserves. But they're already making money out of stuff that they haven't yet dug out of the ground. Now this is not, it's in the ground, it can stay there. It's already above the ground in terms of economics and making profit. So this is why the fossil fuel companies shoot to kill when anybody suggests emissions reductions or carbon trading or whatever methods you want to use to try to control emissions. Um, increasingly, the new fossil fuels are not conventional fossil fuels. There's still a lot of conventional fuels, like oil wells, traditional oil and gas, but now increasingly, this is the tar sands in Alberta, Canada. This is expanding quite rapidly now. This is a proposed pipeline that has been a big battle in the United States. Some unions support it, some unions oppose to it. It's been a huge battle. The tar sands up there in the top northwest of Canada, there's a big pipeline going to go down, and that stuff is going to go into the world market. There's half um, the uh, tar sands, it could potentially be the size of Florida. It's a scar in the earth raw bitumen is exported uh, from. This is just one example. There are many, many examples of extreme energy across the North America, and now increasingly in Europe and other parts of the world, fracking for shale gas is a, is a really growing phenomenon, but encouragingly a growing movement against it. So the energy wonks are talking about a new era of fossil fuels. They're not talking about a transition to renewable energy. They're talking about and this quote, I think, captures it up. This guy is the head, of the, he's the chief economist of the International Energy Association, and he talks about the two different narratives, renewable energy talking in megawatts, which is, and then uh, the fossil fuels talking in gigawatts. And I don't think you need to go to Google to know that gigawatts is a lot bigger than megawatts. Anyway, let's not get too technical. Workers, in the meanwhile, in the energy sector, workers and communities are under attack. It's extremely repressive industry. 
We've seen what happened in South Africa. We've seen what's happened in Kazakhstan, where the people being workers have been murdered by the oil companies and the energy companies. And secondly, we've also seen in, in the United States all the Union coal mining in West Virginia. It was closed largely, or they blew up all the mountains, took the coal, left the workers and the communities with all the pollution, and moved now out to Wyoming and Utah and are strip mining massive amounts of coal there, mainly for export. So what's happening to workers in the industry is that production is up, employment is down, conditions are down also. This is um, even no more energy is coming into the global system. A billion and a half people don't have access to a reliable source of electrical power. They continue to burn firewood, cow dung, whatever it may be, or they don't have any electrical power whatsoever. So even though there's more coming in, you can't say, or the industry can't say, well, we're addressing energy poverty. We're, fighting, we're giving people electrical power. Yes, the electrical power is on the increase in some many countries, but in others, the numbers of people without electrical power actually continues to grow. Now, the second part of my presentation is on the energy transition. I'll try to keep this brief. This is Akim Steiner. He's the head of the United Nations Environment Program. Be warned. The United Nations Environment Program have been able to talk to unions and say, look, between us, we can fight for the green economy. And what the role of the unions is, is to you advocate for workers' rights and decent work within the context of the green economy. But rest assured that the green economy we have in mind is where the private sector and the big corporations lead the way. And so the the narrative of UNEP is something to be really cautious about because if we look at what the global trade union movement has adopted up until recently, it's largely a sort of let's support this narrative because it's the best we've got in this debate. Unions are not a big voice in the green debate globally. They've only just recently got engaged at the international level to try to fight for a green economy. So given the challenges of the labor movement on so many fronts, it makes sense, to some extent, to say our job is to try to get the best we can with the limited resources available to us, politically speaking. So this is not meant as an outright criticism, it's just meant to understand where that narrative is coming from. Now clearly, what we've got is an official optimism coming out of UNEP, saying it's all going in the right direction, but all the data suggests it's going in the wrong direction. We're not going towards renewables, we're extending the fossil fuel economy. So it's an energy expansion, not a transition. When anybody tells you that renewable energy is going up in investment, yes, that's true. <coughs> but the demand for energy is going up dramatically, and increasingly, the, um, the proportion of energy that will be met by fossil fuels, if things go according to the present direction, will be 75% by 2035. And that is a planetary death, if we want to accept that scenario. And we obviously don't. The other thing about renewable energy, I would say, is that if you take out traditional bioenergy, which is wood and pan dung and basic stuff that people burn for heat and light and cooking, if you take that out and you look at modern renewable energy, wind, hydropower, geothermal energy, solar, is a very small proportion. So just to be aware of what is being characterized as renewable energy is not what they call modern renewable energy. The red zones here are countries which have electrical generation of less than 5% <coughs> renewable sources. The, the zones without red, they don't have the data. But you only see a couple of countries, Spain, Portugal, New Zealand, Iceland, maybe one or two more, that are in the, above the 5% area. So it's still very much a fossil-based energy system. I won't don't skip over this slide about carbon capture and nuclear power, if you want to ask questions about that. The main point, though, is there is very little investment going into carbon capture and storage. This was supposed to be a way where we could continue to use fossil fuels by separating the carbon dioxide from the fuel at the point of combustion and storing the carbon underground or in some other space. This is not being invested in um, globally right now. The best case scenario, I'm going to skip over that. I'm going to get skipped now straight forward to the... Um, the debate <laughs> within the labor community, I think, is the most interesting. So I'll spend about three or four more minutes on that, if that's okay. Basically, the, um, there's a growing feeling 
um, among the trade unions that we need a new approach to energy, that we need a new approach to climate change, that we can't rely on green corporations <coughs> to like tap us on the head and say, mm -hmm. yes, we're for the unions, don't worry, we're going to have a green transition and we'll make sure we get a seat at the table. But we have to now reassert the idea that, first of all, that sh energy is so important to the future of society, it was important even before climate change, that it needs to be brought under democratic and public control. So that is a most, one of the most important things. And in Rio de Janeiro, at the Trade Union Assembly, which was organized by the International Trade Union Confederation, there were 400 unions present. This was strongly asserted from the floor, not necessarily from the table at the front, but from the floor, that we need to reassert economic democracy in, in, uh, in energy. So Cornell Global Labor Institute convened a round table and we started a called Energy Emergency, Energy Energy Emergency, Energy Transition in New York last October, two weeks before Hurricane Sandy. It was two weeks later, we were about our hump of white tank. So we were a bit fortunate in that respect. And this is, we produced this document called Resist, Reclaim, Restructure, Unions and the Struggle for Energy Democracy. And some people were here, uh, Seth Gino was here, Fratina from NUMSA, Josh Yamada, last day, there was a number of people who attended that <coughs> event. Now just what are we saying by resist reclaim the structure? We believe that the labor movement has a political obligation to resist big, the big expansion of fossil fuel projects. We understand that workers are in the industry, we understand we need a just transition for those in the industry, we understand that that will take some time, some decades, to have an equitable transition away from fossil fuels, and that can be accomplished if we democratically control and have public ownership of the sector. But the new fossil fuels coming online, like the Keystone XL pipeline and the tar sands, we believe unions have to oppose that. Secondly, reclaim. We don't believe because if it's publicly owned, it's necessary, necessarily doing the right thing. This is not about public-private. The private companies we know make profit, but we see many state-owned companies around the world, Sinopec in China, the Russian companies, the Indian companies, the British companies, the Norwegian companies, all acting like private corporate corporations, even though they may be formally under uh, state control or partially owned by the people, so to speak. But restructure, this is an important point, is the debate about energy democracy has to be tied to the idea that renewables-based energy will be less centralized. There is an enormous capacity to generate electrical power from what they call distributed generation, on-site, wind and solar, feeding into the mm. grid or just producing locally. There's enormous potential, particularly in the global south, where there's more sun in order to do that. So we believe that a new energy system, the transition, will have to also restructure the system <coughs> in a way that it goes away from centralized power. Now, we started in the, in the late last year we, start, we started with a goal to bring, first of all, the first year or two of this project, Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, is do you agree with this analysis? If you don't agree with the analysis or you're unsure, that's fine. But if you generally think that we do need to, we see there is an energy emergency, the energy transition is not happening, that we, although it's a Herculean task, we have to, as unions, start to say the only way we're going to address the ecological crisis, do right by workers and communities, that clean air and clean energy, is if it's under social and democratic control. These are the unions thus far who have said they want to participate in this process. Some of them have given us resources to do the work, and we're beginning to sharpen and deepen our analysis. So we, as you can see, there are some global union federations, there's some national federations, there's also some regional labor bodies who have come in to the picture so far. We're looking at like this, sort of like this. We're trying to grow the number of unions in this community of unions. <coughs> we accept that something different needs to happen. The details we can debate. We need to grow the number to accept that and spread that. And it can be at any level, global union federations, national labor centers, individual unions, even local unions can play a role. We're aiming at the moment at leadership level. This is not an activist network, much as we think that there's some value in that. At the moment, we want to go to leaders and say, this is the energy emergency. The transition's not happening. We need a new approach. Are you on board? 
And if they say, yes, we're interested, they go in part of the project and they're invited to our discussions and our meetings. So we've got different levels of engagement. We do have a global advisory group working conference that's going to come, that's going to happen in October. We do have a trade union uh, for energy democracy bulletin. If you're not on the list of people who are getting that bulletin, we're happy to add you to the list. But to conclude, I would say that the, um, the search for a new narrative now is so necessary uh, that we, there is really no time to lose. I'd like to recognize the, the work of uh, unions like NUMSA in South Africa, the idea for this initiative <coughs> from when I was invited to go to Johannesburg and speak at a conference that was titled Renewable Energy, Too Important to be Left in Private Hands, was the slogan of that conference. And NUMSA, the National Union of Metal Workers in South Africa, the largest union in Africa now, is taking the lead on this, but other unions are engaged and moving forward in building this agenda for energy democracy. So we want you to favor your unions if you can, be part of it, try to stay connected with us, and let's build this project together. So I'll hand it over to Alana now and see if she can say a few words about where transport fits into this perspective. I'm just wondering if people... <laughs> it's, Sean's just given so much content, so I'm wondering if we want to have a little bit of discussion before we move on to the ITF presentation, because you've heard a lot from the top table this morning. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, but I, I, I would just like to understand better whether you're presenting to us a particular program or whether we are discussing the, the concept of the energy crisis per se. Uh, <coughs> If I, because, okay, on the program, probably I have very little to say because I work in a very different kind of sector. But if we are talking about energy and mm -hmm. the crisis of energy in the global context and what is leading to climate change, uh, I, would, I would imagine that there are various issues that one would relate. Uh, one, we wouldn't only talk about um, fuel, fossil fuel mm -hmm. energy per se. Mm -hmm because energy in the larger context and the issues that are causing climate issues, problems today, have to do also with, for instance, food energy. Mm -hmm. Because that's basic energy for all of us to survive. So what's happening in the agricultural sector, where a lot of emissions are also taking place because of the kind of fossil fuels that are used in the production of food. Mm -hmm. That's one aspect. The other aspect today is that several countries are talking about biofuels and where a lot of food land is being converted into fuel, uh, you know, so food land is being taken away. So these are huge mm -hmm. issues that impact on populations like us in the entire South. So how does all that fit into a worker's understanding about what's happening to climate change? The other issue that I feel very concerned about is that energy also has to do with creating the labor class for tomorrow, which is energy creating labor for tomorrow which is where all these women's labor comes comes in. Mm. And if you look at our issues from our country, um, the, the women's issues uh, related to production of the labor class um, and the issues related to women sustaining this whole labor for tomorrow has a lot to do with the kind of energy we use even at home and how we, how we even cook our food. So for me, if we really want to open this whole discussion into understanding the future and what is impacting on climate change, then unless we introduce into our understanding these concepts of food and agriculture, of women's productivity and how it plays out in our union, uh, we are not really grasping this whole future of environmental sustainability for the future. Because sustainability, and then, of mm -hmm. course, I'm not mentioning war, because and none of us ever speaks about war. But war uses a hell of a lot of energy, mm -hmm. never included into our analysis. And so where do workers' unions stand vis to these issues? So I'm, I would just wonder whether we need to broaden our understanding so that we can speak to workers in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. <coughs> um, one moment? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm the lady who just spoke. Uh, I'm Leia from Mumbai, Pakistan. Whereas my questions uh, would be adding to what Nandini has uh, mentioned. 
to my understanding, uh, we were here for the climate change and the challenges that we faced. One of the one important sectors that uh, was missed out, is she has <coughs> rightly pointed out, is the agriculture sector or the rural sector that is uh, 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 with regard to the climate change and can be a productive sector, which is being neglected. There are other sectors which I think should be part of this. It's, uh, uh, it's the forestry, mm -hmm. which is uh, in the context of environment change and climate change is a major thing. And uh, countries like uh, Pakistan and India, and maybe uh, other countries like Sri Lanka, we I know about some people's movement there, with, where uh, the land grabbing and the forestry, uh, they have developed some uh, um, resistance for that. And also, uh, with regard to the fish fishery, the marine life, uh, that is again related to the land grabbing and marine life affecting the climate change. And where uh, I know quite a lot of people's movements around marine life, where the, the, the land grabbing and the many rivers and sustainability of the environment is a major challenge. And when you said uh, it's the labor movement has a critical commitment to. Uh, Secure the rights of the laborers or the workers. All of the people working in, the, in these particular sectors that I have mentioned are also uh, uh, working as labor, whether they are informal or they are mm. formal, but they are working in this sector. So, how do you see that in uh, this context? Okay. So, let's take a few more questions. Kaki and then Fatima. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Sanjeev and I'm from Asia Monitor Resources. Okay, uh, just quickly. I mean, I, I really appreciate this uh, initiative. I have some four structural questions. One is, uh, we're talking about the change in narrative, but uh, uh, my sincere apologies, I don't think narrative has changed because I watched all those movies in Inconvenient. Mm -hmm. I think we're bringing the same thing, I mean, the same analysis is coming here. But what I want to question is not only what we're talking about is changing the forms of energy, it may not be solar, but it, sorry, it may not be the fossil fuel, but it will be like a greener, so a technological fix or a complex sociological problem. Uh, but what about the way we are consuming it? You see, we're not even talking about that as union. We cannot live the way <laughs> we have lived in the past 50 years. I mean, there's a simple thing, and can unions take a a bold stand on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we cannot, a house cannot use and we cannot have these many cars, you know. Can automobile company, our unions come ahead? You see, this is the basic thing. We cannot ask people from South, you cannot have these things because you will pollute the environment. And second, how does this global supply chain work right now? I mean, we can buy water, French water, in India, which is being shipped all the way from uh, France, and we don't get any local water because Coke uses all the water, mm -hmm. especially in Kerala and Nalini. Uh, so these are the broader structural questions, mm -hmm. you know, not just changing the energy from fossil fuel to a green fuel. I think they're falling in the trap of the mainstream narrative. We are not changing the basic democracy of the way the work is organized, mm -hmm. who owns the resources, what is being polluted, because energy is not the only threat to the sustainability. If you see the way things are being produced and consumed right now, we are killing millions. I mean, for one million people die every year in Asia due to work, and it's a very conservative estimate. So this, I think this has to be seen in a more synergetic way. <laughs> then energy will fall in its place. This, to me, looks like as if we have taken their narrative and we want to lead this narrative rather than giving it to their own community. Okay, I'm going to take one more comment and then give Sean a chance to respond and then take the next round. Okay, so Fatima. Yeah, um, hello, Fatima from uh, the of Spain. Um, and also an activist in the Neo Green Party. So um, I just some very um, direct questions. So. Um, First of all, is does the union thinks about decreasing? I mean, um, um, as the colleagues said before, um, 
I think they are gonna, I mean, these private companies are gonna try to use the this new green deal as an opportunity to spread again the neoliberalism branches. Um, uh, but I'm not sure whether unions are aware really about decreasing. I mean, the, we cannot live in the same way we have been living, as the comrades said before. Um, just to give you an example, in Europe, 80% of, of the pollution is by private car. When do you use your private mm -hmm. car? When you are going to the job, when, when you go to the, to the job. So um, this is one of the uh, questions. And the other one is, um, how do we um, work to this really fair transition? Because it is clear that this new Green Deal uh, economy and green jobs for everybody um, doesn't mean that these workers are going to have the same rights or better, better jobs or better rights. So um, I think as unionists, we will have to fight against this. Thank you. Do you want to respond to yeah. what's already come up and yeah. then we'll take some more comments? No, I'm not in there. no, it doesn't matter. I think this is a really this rich really discussion, so I'd prefer. Questions. I mean, yeah. I want to come first of all to um, um, what the brother said and Richard. What's your name, Comrade Sanji. Sanji. Very, very good questions, but I disagree. I disagree respectfully, of course. The This is not sort of trying to take leadership of their transition. If we have, what, what I said in my opening comments, and I, I'd like to repeat them is that if we want to address the climate challenge, we need a strategic approach. Like who are the main problems here? And we believe that the fossil fuel corporations are a, huge, a big player in the global capitalist elite. And uh, the energy issue is so clear in terms of the need for democratic control, if you bring in the support of other movements, that it is a point of entry into politics. I've been reading, and we all have, for the last 20 years about how we need to consume less, how we need to have a more integrated approach. I agree with all that. But this is an attempt to, to, to make a connection between an analysis of that we need a profound restructuring of society with how do we take over a strategic sector that can help us do that. If we did, and of course it's all dreamland stuff at this stage, but if we had democratic control over energy, we immediately start to talk about the need of supply and demand. Why do we have to keep having more power generation supply when we can reduce demand? If you have democratic control over that, you can plan that. Secondly, why should energy, electrical power, be a commodity? What makes it a commodity? We obviously have costs associated with the generating electrical power, but why then do you have to sell it in kilowatt hours to people, which means then there's a price on it. If you had it as a service, and then you could also, by doing that, again have what they call demand destruction. You focus on reducing demand. But we can only do that if we have control over the sector. So the sort of questions that Conway raised, and they are very good questions, about the systemic and holistic aspects of it, must be addressed by, first of all, looking at the components and how to address that. It's not that we start with the components and ignore the systemic. But we start with the systemic problem and say, how do we intercept the present system with control over a key strategic sector. But I invite you and others to be part of this debate because we wouldn't say that we have all the answers to this. There are many deep and rich insights. Secondly, on agriculture and food and the role, if the uh, sisters and comrades were absolutely on target with that. And it is not adequately integrated into the document. And that, some of that is a capacity issue and, in, and the capacity for us to engage unions who have a working knowledge and, um, and an understanding of those questions. We're aware, like everybody else, that agriculture and, and the fossil fuels that go into agriculture, and land use and deforestation, is a huge part of the climate problem. It probably could be as much as 50% of the problem. But what I said in the outset was, the energy sector power generation pertains mostly to the developed of the global north at this stage. So it's starting here, but it doesn't need to end there. And again, the invitation is please come on board and be part of this and help us understand and enrich this, this conversation. There may be one or two other questions, but I sense I'm going on a little bit too long, so I don't want to... Um... I think it's a question that Fatima asked. Oh, yes, yes, if I may. This was on about the Green New Deal, and yeah. I forgot about the basic... The basic thing is the consumption question, 
or one of the one of the issues? Yeah, is is yeah, one of the issues is that really the unions we are working with them. Um, yeah. The unions think about recruiting because you know we defend worker rights. Yeah. But um, we defend also we are like capitalists and anti-capitalist is crazy. So uh, for this new green deal, mm. uh, I don't know if unions think about decreasing. I mean, the society as a whole, you know, uh, even if we are the old power, mm. you know, yeah. it's a little bit complicated. I don't know if unions are thinking about this issue. Most issue. of the global union bodies, as you know, global union federations, yeah. and the International Trade Union Confederation, I can't speak for World Federation of Trade Unions, I don't know their position, but I sense they all agree that we need a radical reduction of emissions and we need to have more control over production and consumption. They all agree with the fundamentals of that. But the problem comes when we don't have power in the sector, that when you have someone who comes along, like Trans Canada Corporation, who wants to build a pipeline that's going to hire 5,000 workers, they're saying, well, yeah, over the long term, we're for emissions reduction, but right now we mm. need jobs and we need to protect our members. This is obviously a very self-limiting narrative that we need to fight against uh, in the short term, in the here and now. And there's no easy answer to it, as you can appreciate, being in Spain and all the problems going on there. But I think that's, um, we, we feel that there, the awareness of the ecological crisis in among union members generally over the, across the world is growing up, as it is across the broader population. But we have to move our unions in a way that we can have some real impact in the immediate and not just hope that over the long term some green capitalists are going to solve the problem for us because they're clearly not going to do that. So. Okay, there were a whole lot of other people who I'm had contributions to you and this Graham. No, 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 it's fine. We can always do the transport later. Right. No, I mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to talk about this um, uh, framework, but uh, I, I would like to share about uh, like the challenges which uh, uh, trade unions are facing in, um, in, uh, in Pakistan. Like, uh, you know, there is a, a big energy crisis and a lot of factories and uh, um, a lot of uh, workers are coming out of their work and factories are shifting to uh, another country. You know, when we have these kind of fundamental issues like uh, trade unions in Pakistan, uncertainty for association, freedom, a freedom for association, and then uh, there are threats, and then there are uh, like um, there are fragmentations among the um, uh, trade unions and the region, and all uh, these issues. You know, in this kind of context, this uh, energy and uh, this green um, energy concepts are far behind from uh, uh, from the on the end of uh, trade unions. So then there is this uh, all energy issue is uh, very much politicized in Pakistan and then like uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, like uh, you know the, the nation was kept in this uh, in this impression that because India is an enemy country so they're not giving us uh, you know water to generate uh, electricity. Yeah, so yes. all these kind of uh, issues are there. So in this kind of uh, kind of environment environment it's really become difficult, you know, to go to these kind of um, uh, more theoretical and more uh, practical kind of issues. Yeah, Graham, please, from the UCU. Um, yeah, on the face of it, it might be easier to build a mass social movement on a focused campaign and write this than, say, you know, drive the system. But I think, you know, your experience, and certainly mine, is that there are still a lot of tricky questions in terms of how you agree um, a, uh, the demands of the campaign. I mean, two quick examples in the UK. We discussed this at the TUC, and although some unions like mine have signed up for, for this initiative, there are others like Prospect that are members of energy professionals in the sector who don't support the demand for uh, renationalisation. So there's this issue about, well, how do you find public ownership and um, you know, how, how flexible can we be that on that to bring people in? And the second one is we, we passed a motion at our Congress um, last month uh, supporting a campaign on divestment. Mm. Um, going back to your point about the carbon bubble and how the financial markets are predicated on all this stuff coming out of the ground. And um, People and Planet was one of the main student groups in the UK support that demand, whereas the NUS, National Union of Students, which are another key group for us to work with, uh, don't support divestment, <laughs> but support ethical investment. So, 
you know, that's another one where there's a debate. I'm sure these things know to be resolved, but you know, it does throw up this question about you know how do we try and get a broad front on this and still keep everybody in it who wants to participate. Yeah. And Joshua, and then Cedric. Yeah. Uh, thanks, John. Yes, Joshua Madan from the Philippines, from the Lands Progressive Labour. Um, several comments, if I can, uh, if I may. Uh, first, the I understand the, the comrades from Sanji made a point about the need for narrative and other comments as well. And I think I'm coming from the fact that I've been participating in this initiative since uh, Trinidad and Tobago, where we had this much more ambitious uh, project <laughs> uh, of, of trying to imagine a trade union vision for an alternative, which we stopped short of calling socialist. <laughs> but it was really an exercise where we tried to you know, reinvent the light on socialism. But my experience, from my very much experience, I think that was too ambitious at that point in time. So when this came up, I thought that this was a, a far better way of doing it because you're building, you're trying to build the narrative you know, by focusing on specific campaigns. It doesn't mean that we we cannot, we should link, of course we should link this belief in the continuous effort to build that narrative, the broader one. But I think this is building up that part of that narrative and contributes. So that's my but that's my point, my point about all these questions about you know, is this is the way to go. But having said that, uh, I think we should all be aware that the, as, as Sean has mentioned, and, and thanks for mentioning it, Sean, I think there really is a struggle inside the labor movement at this point in time about time because mm. uh, because ITUC adopted uh, the green jobs uh, narrative of, of, of ILO, which is linked consciously, was consciously linked by the ILO with the union's idea of green economy, mm. which essentially is a, re, a branding of a rebranding of capitalism. So I had a debate with them with some ILO people and unit people in, 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 a, in an ILO activity in Turin uh, about two months ago. And the only question, the, the only response that I got from unit is that, well, it was a tactical move, which made that, uh, <laughs> you know, green jobs much more known. You know, uh, if you link it with, with the green coin, I thought that that was a, I thought that that was a <laughs> clever, if you like, uh, answer. That, that that is really a non-answer. No? <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, so that's 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 the kind of problem that we have. No? At this point in time, there are national unions out there who have been advocating uh, the things that we want, but the ITUC itself has to still move towards towards that direction. Uh, the other point I like to make is about yeah, about uh, our struggle for alternatives as well. I think one of the biggest problems, at least on our on our part, when we had debate with our governments back home in the Philippines, is the fact that there is this really strong argument against our renewable arguments for renewable energy because they would say they would usually say, "Oh, but renewable energies cannot provide the basic." Mm. You know that technical, pseudo technical response, you know, to, to our, all our critique. No? But I think it's a legitimate question. Mm. Unfortunately, we are not technically mm. you know, uh, equipped to respond to because we haven't seen one. You know, uh, could, could solar energy be provided the base load? I think that is something that we really need to, mm -hmm. to respond to. Uh, finally, Joshua, can I stop you there? Just maybe we've got two minutes left, yeah, and we've still got two comrades that's wanting that's to speak. That's fine. Very quick. We need to go, go link this campaign with climate jobs as well as with, with campaign to make TNCs more accountable. Yeah, so, mm. Yeah, and then you, Sandra. Yeah, uh, first, yeah, but GMB, a uh, uh, comment and uh, a, a question, Sean. I mean, on that, this is a huge subject, and I think it's right mm. to say that one of the hardest jobs is going to be actually uh, establishing the parameters for what you're going uh, to uh, try and do. However, ultimately, of course, you've got to take the public along with it. And I actually think, at least in the UK, we could potentially be pushing it an open door because people see the price they're paying for energy. Yeah. Mm. And this has been charged by private companies who at the same time trashing the planet. And this is becoming increasingly, I think public kind of increasingly aware. These two policies come together could give us a could give us an opening. But well, I have a specific question, because it's always best to think for something. My own union's policy is to support the nuclear industry. Yeah. And the reason I support the nuclear industry is because, not surprisingly, we have thousands of workers in the nuclear mm. industry. However, that's not I don't think that's a that's not a good way to judge the efficacy of anything, just because you've got members there. Because I've had some terrible arguments with our members in the past, making political remarks like, 
Well, if we had emergency concentration camps, we think they were a good idea as well. We've still got the bruises to prove it. But you see the point I'm making is sort of in a flippant way. And of course, the problem with nuclear is it potentially looks like nice clean energy because there's no emissions, but it is extremely expensive and it's extremely risky. So I'd be interested to hear what your views are on that particular part of energy. Okay, and then Cedric? Okay, no, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I will just talk about our how we entered into the debate. Uh, we, South Africa is a country that is endowed with uh, coal, which is a, a, a problem source for, for energy. And um, we were then saying when when the ITUC and everyone was talking about the just transition, we were to pose a question. Just transition for who? Mm -hmm. uh, because for us, that was a fundamental question. Is it a just transition for capitalists to, to devise new ways of, of, of making profit? Or should it be just a transition for, for the workers and, and the poor? And we felt that participating in, 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 in this kind of initiative is the one that is going to ensure that we, we steer the, the direction. Because basically the resolution from our union is saying that renewable energy must be socially open. We must all fight for social order. Should not even be talking about the behavior of the TNCs, because we don't want TNCs to, to have space there. Because most of the endowments for renewable energy are, are, are basically natural resources. Mm -hmm. It's water, it's wind, it's sun. So where, why must the TNCs come into, into play there? Mm -hmm. Yes, I know that uh, for the countries in the north who are far advanced in terms of renewable energy, you will have to be talking about renationalization because already the, the TNCs are playing a role there. But in our continent in the south, uh, there's not much TNCs that are in that space. They are coming. Uh, and some of them are coming through the NGOs like uh, the, the Clinton Foundation and, and, and all of them. And we see them coming. And we want to block that from happening and say to, to our government, to our pension funds, remember I said we spoke about the role of the pension funds, to our trustees in the pension funds to say that here is a virgin uh, space that no one is going to say you are nationalizing, you are doing this. And we, we think that workers uh, and, and communities must play on them. Mm -hmm. Do you just want to make a few Three concluding comments? Yeah? On nuclear, um, Bert, thanks for that comment. In the document, we tried to take this on and said that we don't see the goal of this project is to say this form of energy is good, this form of energy is bad. Our goal is to say let's put all the options on the table. The criteria for labor and social movements and people generally is to make the best choices based on ecological and social implications of any choice. And there is a case to be made for a next generation nuclear power. I don't want to make the case, uh, but I respect that it's out there. Whereas the other issue around nuclear is if we decommission nuclear power on safety issues. Now, if it's replaced with by fossil-based power, it's basically a no-brainer. And we saw this in Japan with Fukushima. The environmental movement got really excited when they closed down the fleet of 51, I think, nuclear reactors following the Fukushima disaster. But Japan's emissions went up because they imported more coal from Australia, from South Africa, and from elsewhere. So if we're going to get carbon instead of nuclear, then that's not the option. So the question is not just the socialization of the industry, but the socialization of the choices we have to make. So, you know, this is not sidestepping the problem, but it's actually saying we should put <coughs> all the facts on the table and not just say we're for wind and solar and against nuclear and coal. Second, on baseload, I just want to respond also to what Joshua and Sanjay said. I think most, the, the green economy debate has been about overemphasizing technological grids. I accept that. But, and our response, or the narrative in the left, has been it's not about technology, it's about social relations and control. That's fine too. But I think we need to acknowledge that there are technological challenges associated with an energy transition, and we need to have a full grasp of those challenges. And one is the baseload issue that Joshua raised. How do we sustain, how do we overcome the problem that the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time? There are, I believe, technological solutions to that problem on um, basically software and internet technology that can make the grid smart and responsive. 
This is technology developed by capitalism, frankly, but funded by public funds often. So why don't we take over that technology in the same way as we took over the railroad industries that were also built by capitalism? We can take back and reclaim what really our labor produced. So I don't see a problem in it. There is a case for an argument on, on the technological issues. So I think that um, the, the, those are the two points. I can't address the others now, I'm afraid, yeah. but I'm not sure sure. if I left anybody's points. Um, and, are we getting some cross looks from Joe at the back yeah, of the room? What <laughs> the heck is going on? Because <laughs> everyone's waiting to come back in. So I'm really sorry that was so rushed. Um, and maybe I'm sorry there'll be for some. You. You no, that's some fine. <laughs> so maybe there are other possibilities in the program of the week to come back to these issues. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Everybody.